Welcome. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Better. Today, I'm really honored to host what I know will be a fascinating conversation. Uh, college campuses across the country have struggled this fall with the right way to bring their students back to school. And the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has taken a novel and ambitious approach for their 47,000 students uh, and their faculty and staff. They developed their own rapid saliva test for COVID-19. They built their own software system to manage the student body and all of the activity, which includes an app and a system that integrates with building controls. It's arguably the most comprehensive approach of any large university trying to bring its uh, student body back to campus this fall. And there were a lot of people involved in developing this whole system, but none have been more central to the effort than Bill Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is a professor of landscape architecture and the director of the university's Smart Healthy Community Initiative. He and his team developed an open source platform to support healthier and safer communities, which when you think about it, is exactly what the campus and the world needs right now. Bill will be interviewed by Michelle Hoffman, who's the Senior Vice President of Healthcare and Life Sciences at P33. And today's, collab today's program is a collaboration between Matter and P33, which is a privately funded not-for-profit organization tasked with elevating Chicago into a tier one tech ecosystem. Today's program is also being supported by the Healthcare Council of Chicago, MHUB, and 1871. If you have any questions for Bill, please use the chat function and Michelle will try to work them into the conversation. And with that, I am delighted to turn things over to Michelle to lead this conversation. Thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I have had the pleasure of talking to Bill in the past, so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's willing to say on camera. Um, great. So Bill, why don't we just start, let's start at the very beginning, right? So it's March, everybody shut down, nobody knows what's happening. Uh, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion. Sometime around March or April, maybe you can say when, the University of Illinois made a decision to try to bring back its students in the fall, right? So you could arguably say that the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign uh, was thinking way far ahead of other institutions. So maybe help us understand what decision was made, why you all felt you had to make the decision when you did, and then what did you decide to do? Well, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, we, we closed our campus on March 13th, uh, Friday, March 13th, um, and we moved all of our classes uh, online at that date, and we we actually closed our buildings and we asked all employees to, uh, except for essential employees who had to keep the physical plant functioning um, to to work from home. And um, immediately at that time, the group and I from the Smart Healthy Community Initiative, we, we, we had been working for um, about a year and three quarters at that point on building open source software that would support the development of apps, mobile apps that would enable smart health communities. And so we built this infrastructure that's open source and free to anybody that wants to download it. And we thought, well, gosh, we've done all this work. Are there ways that we can employ the hard work that we've done in the service of creating a, self, a safer, healthier campus when, when people come back? So we, starting March 13th, we, we turned our attention to that question and began to connect with colleagues uh, and students uh, all across campus. Um, and at the same time, independent of that, um, colleagues in um, chemistry and the med school and the vet med school were starting to look at ways that we could rapidly test uh, for the virus. And uh, as you know, the nas nasal pharyngeal swab 
was the most widely used uh, testing technique at that time. Um, and it, it had several challenges associated with it. Uh, one, it's uncomfortable. Secondly, in Illinois, it was taking um, many days for results to re be returned. And so the, our, our colleagues in, in the College of Medicine and the, in engineering and chemistry, they really started to put their heads together to think about ways in which we could um, create a fast, a much faster test. And then results came out of Rutgers that a saliva test might be the trick. And they jumped on that and um, they, they created a saliva test that um, allows us to get results back in less than two hours. You know, if you do one test, you can get results back in less than two hours. Scaling is and, a little different. Um, yeah, right. And um, uh, they also found that um, by um, doing the saliva-based test only, they could remove quite a number of steps. And removing uh, quite a number of steps in the typical PCR process meant that they could um, dramatically reduce the cost uh, because there were material costs and supply chain challenges that they didn't have to meet. Right. And while they were working on this, uh, other colleagues in um, physics and epidemiology were starting to figure out if they could, you know, glean the literature and make models of the spread of the virus and the conditions under which the spread would likely to accelerate or decelerate. Um, and they began testing various models uh, for campus, for the county, and for the state of Illinois. And, and in parallel to to those two efforts, our efforts were thinking about, well, you know, we'd need to help people understand how to get their test results as quickly as possible. We'd want to work with the county health departments to identify the next steps that they should take. Um, we should allow them to self-report system symptoms like the CDC website suggests. Um, and then there was this report out, out, of, um, out of Europe about this decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing protocol, what we, what we now call exposure notification, that it will allow you to understand um, if, if your phone has been in close proximity to another phone um, for a certain amount of time uh, using Bluetooth. And then later one of those phones would become, um, uh, the owner of one of those phones gets a positive test result and uh, you would get a notification um, depending on how much time you spent in close proximity with that person. So we, we started building all of these pieces. And um, so these three entities were working kind of separately from each other. And then very early on um, in mid-April, uh, the provost started moving the pieces around. And by, by the end of April, we'd come together and decided, gosh, there, if we put these three efforts together, we could really do something quite significant. So, so, and let me just recap, right? So independently across campus, sometime around March, April, you have people who are thinking about how do we use technology for exposure alerts and also to make sure that we seamlessly get people their test results. You have people who are developing a novel uh, coronavirus test, right? And then the third piece is, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, in all honesty, from a national perspective, we're still arguing with right now, but you actually had to come up with the rules of engagement, the rules of quarantining. What, what would happen um, you know, if you were positive or you were exposed, et cetera. So, so how, did, how did the team figure that out, which arguably could be, I don't wanna say harder, but just as hard as some of these other technology innovations? Right, so that, that um, so you know, uh, as Stephen suggested when he, or said when he, when he uh, introduced me, I'm a professor of landscape architecture, and I've spent my I've been spent 30 years studying how to create healthy places. But you wouldn't want to trust my impressions about what, how to interpret these guidelines with respect to mm -hmm. isolation or quarantine. And that is true with the vast majority of the people on our team uh, sure. and, and these teams. So we we went right to the experts in the in the medical college and also in um, in the uh, Illinois Department of Public Health, but mostly in our Champaign-Urbana Public Health District. And we worked closely with those folks to understand what their guidelines were for the county and how they related to us. And we, we negotiated and understood and learned from them. We built 
our we built their participation into the into the team in, um, in early May in terms of how we designed it, how we designed the Illinois app or the the uh, Safer Illinois app and um, the protocols and the rules, the back end pieces that mm -hmm. we that we wrote. And those we wrote in a way that allowed us to change the, the rules over time. And that's been smart because they have been changing. Because people don't agree. So, and, and that's, I think that's the other question is, right? And I, and I know that I've spoken with other uh, colleagues of yours at the University of Illinois, right? And they were saying there really wasn't, they, they borrowed a lot from around the world, right? There was no template in the United States. Can you just comment a little bit on that? Just to give us a little bit of flavor of how, uh, how did you make the order from the chaos? And I understand, you know, the rules of quarantine, but again, just even looking at, you know, which systems to implement and uh, how often to give the tests and things like that. What, what, how did you create your own template? Well, we, we relied a lot on the data that we were getting uh, from various places. So we, we read as many of the publications that were coming out, the pre, we read the preprints. Yep. Um, we we paid very careful attention to um, how much testing was being done in other places and how rapidly the results were coming and, back and and when you say other places were you looking at other countries yeah. other states yeah. was there some places that you care to comment might be best in class that you looked at for a template well i would say that we didn't have good examples in the united states this spring um, so we had to look outside uh, because other countries were uh, grappling with the um, public health consequences of the virus in a much more assertive and comprehensive fashion than we chose to do here in the United States. So mm -hmm. um, we looked at Taiwan, we, we looked at New Zealand, uh, South Korea, Japan, China, um, Germany, mm -hmm. um, as, as um, places where we could learn from the 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 whole range of techniques that they were using. Um, I've I've spent a fair amount of ta time in in Taiwan and in China. I'm an adjunct professor at a at National Taiwan University. Uh, so I was in touch with my colleagues there a great deal, and they immediately moved to in March. Everyone was wearing masks. They were checking people's IDs and temperatures every time you came into a building. Uh, mm -hmm. We we thought that at the time we thought, oh, that's so smart because. Um, at the time, we thought you would be symptomatic before you would be mm. contagious. Now we understand you can be contagious before you're, as before you're symptomatic. Right. And in the case of um, the vast majority of young people, uh, uh, almost 50% of young people are asymptomatic the entire time they have the, the virus. Right. So right. those aggressive steps uh, didn't prove to be as effective as we thought. But, but our approach was to look beyond our shores to find examples of things that were really working well to understand what the Germans were doing and what the South Koreans uh, were doing and to try and figure out, well, would those things work here? Right. So, so let's say I am, uh, I am fortunate enough to go back in time and be an undergraduate at the University of Illinois. Um, it's August, let's say the middle of August, and I'm preparing to come back. I come back, can you walk me through all of the steps that I have to go through with the program that will keep me and my peers safe? Great. So let's uh, let's assume you're uh, a student that lives in campus housing. Let's mm -hmm. let's imagine it's your first year at Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been in, we've been in communication with you about what to expect and what you need to bring to campus, and um, the, we've described the protocol for you for the the, the day in which you move in. And um, so instead of having the typical move-in day in which you go right to your uh, housing residence. Um, you had to you you drove to the the big athletic facility, the State Farm Center, where we have uh, Big Ten basketball games, and it's a mm -hmm. huge parking lot. And we staged the entry experience there, in which um, you got a you got this saliva-based PCR test at the, in the moment. You got your university ID signed to you at that time. Um, you got your keys to your room. Uh, you got a time in which you could go from that parking lot to the room and be escorted from your automobile with your uh, with your goods. You can have one family member join you and go up to your room. Uh, mm -hmm. It was all sequenced. Instead of doing it in a four day period, we did it, I think in an eight day period yep. in order to stretch that out. Um, 
And then we had many fewer kind of um, socializing activities that we would typically do uh, on campus at the beginning of the semester to, to help create a sense of commu community and help people meet each other. Uh, we did many of those things uh, online uh, and social mm -hmm. distance in the, the social distance fashion. Um, we also kind of ex we asked we asked the students to um, do something that's um, kind of counter to the developmental stage of being a late adolescence, and which is to kind of stay back from social engagement and to um, to wear a mask mm -hmm. and um, to to not take advantage of your newfound freedom uh, being your first semester on campus and. Um, that, that we, in other words, we asked a lot of our students. Right. right. We the talk majority a, of them did well. Right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how it went and how's it going, but just really quickly before we get there, tell me a little bit. I, you know, so I'm checked in. I, I'm wearing my mask. I meet my roommate. Tell me how the Safer Illinois app is going to be used my day to day. So um, this the Safer Illinois app. Uh, it's something that many people downloaded before they came to campus, but certainly w when they were at the State Farm Center on their first day, uh, they were encouraged to download. And um, it has a, uh, a bunch of features that are really useful, not the least of which is that um, it's got a little back-end decision-making matrix that um, seeks to understand your health events, your recent health events, Mm -hmm. And if your recent health events are in a certain healthy fashion, you get access to university buildings. You have mm -hmm. a, we have a, a building entry status card that has a number of security features on it. It shows your picture and uh, the date and um, whether or not your access is granted or denied into buildings. So um, in order to get into campus buildings, you need to present that status card uh, to enter. And in order to get that status card functioning, all of us on campus in the first uh, couple of weeks, we were testing once a week. And um, so you had to get a saliva-based test once a week. And um, that got you entry into buildings for the, for the next mm -hmm. seven days. So, so again, extending this analogy of me and my undergraduate years, I have this app. Now I'm concerned, right? I'm concerned because I feel like you're tracking me wherever I go. And that is worrisome to me. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, how you guys thought about that and what, what you would say to me to allay my concerns and also what are my options if I'm just not comfortable having this level of surveillance? It was a super important question and it was, um, it was on our minds uh, from the very first day. And it was on our minds from the very first day because we operate in, an, in, in a context at the University of Illinois here in which privacy is, um, not only is it a very uh, important social question, but it's a very important academic question. And we have colleagues in many areas of campus that study every single day the consequences of privacy, the consequences of privacy invasion, the consequences of me ciphering your digital exhaust and finding ways to monetize that without your knowledge or consent, the consequences of that for society. Um, and uh, we've, I, I've had many dozens of interactions, uh, formal interactions with colleagues, with deans, with the campus leadership, with um, departments in town halls and open houses with um, colleagues and students. and again and again and again we got that very clear message make sure we have choice make sure we can we can opt in or opt out make sure i have control over my data and i do not want under any circumstances the president or the chancellor to know that i went home for lunch today <laughs> um, or where i was or what time i got to work and we took we took all of those concerns very seriously um, but then we did more than that. We, we engaged with you guys at P33 and you did your own independent research on these questions and you really reinforced the, the very fundamental notions that we had. And, and then we worked with ACLU, we had a discussion with um, ACLU folks and they went through our app um, as we were developing it. And they said, 
why do you collect this information? Do you really need that? Can you get rid of it? And how about this? And how about that? And uh, four or five pieces of information that we were collecting. And we thought hard about it. We said, you know what? Let's not collect any of that. Let's, let's collect only the information we need to take action on in order to keep an individual safe. Mm -hmm. And so um, we collected very little information. We don't collect any location data. So we can't tell where people are. Uh, we can't tell where they've been. Uh, no location data is collected, none is stored, and none ever leaves your phone from our app. Mm -hmm. um, but, but at the so same time, I guess we, oh, sorry, I was going to say, but at the same time, you are doing, and, and I think it's, it's worthwhile for the audience, you are doing a surveillance of proximity. And, and maybe you could right. just explain, you know, why, why is that useful from a, a privacy perspective and a safety perspective in a way that location is not? Well, we, we really worked to engage this privacy preserving proximity uh, um, technology. Uh, mm -hmm. we, use the, we use the very similar protocol that Google and Apple uh, through their APIs uh, mm -hmm. have, have developed. Uh, it's powered by low energy Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. And um, if, so a couple of things. So, the, so we ask people to opt in uh, for exposure notification. We further ask them to opt in to enable location services because Google in particular requires that you ask for that in order to use the Bluetooth technology. Mm -hmm. So we ask people to opt in for that. And then um, if they've opt in for those, then we provide them uh, the service in which um, the, the phones send these uh, tokens or keys uh, or little chirps, you could say. Um, and the phones not only send a chirp and remember all the chirps that they've sent, but when they receive a chirp, they re they remember the they record the the, the digital code of, of mm -hmm. that chirp. And um, what's lovely about this is the those those uh, digital codes are um, independent of your phone, right. and they're independent of your location. Right. So um, when a when a when someone gets a digital exposure notification, they don't know. Um, they don't know who got recently tested positive, mm -hmm. and they don't know where that person, you, where you were with that person. Um, but we do tell them the day. We, we tell them the day that they got, ex that, we, that the technology suggests they were exposed. Mm -hmm. And we tell them the day because the day is important in terms of understanding how long they're, they're gonna be in a self quarantine. Mm -hmm. But the process really does a lovely job of preserving privacy and shielding people's information about who, who actually got tested positive. Um, it does a lovely job of that. Now, there have been some people that say, oh, and you may have seen articles like this, oh, uh, you, can, you can spin out a scenario in which you can hack that system. Mm -hmm. And um, the scenario that you need to use to hack that system depends on an enormous amount of luck. And, you know, if I wanted to hack you, Michelle, and find out if you ever got the disease, for instance, or find out more mm -hmm. information about you, I'd have to be lucky enough to capture some of your codes mm -hmm. in a short enough time frame that you actually developed the disease and got sick. Um, and then I would have to hack into those codes and make sure I was able to identify that those codes were associated with you. And um, there's, there's a whole lot easier ways for me to, f to find out information about you. So we can use facial recognition to, mm -hmm. to find out about you, to track your movements, um, right. the police are interested. So, so that while it's possible to break the privacy con uh, conditions mm -hmm. of, uh, of this, it's not so much a concern for the, um, I don't think it's a, it's a reasonable concern for the vast majority of us. If somebody's interested, they're going to use more accessible technology that doesn't rely on us getting the disease. Right, right. And just and just to clarify, right? If if I'm exposed, I get an alert on my phone, right? But the actual positivity that I might get from a test, even like that information, 
doesn't leave my phone. Is that right? Right. So student health will get my information and it can be acted on there. But in terms of what's on my phone, that's also not necessarily, that's not going to some centralized server somewhere. Well, okay. So um, let me be clear about this. In the state of Illinois, um, the laboratory that analyzes the sample, so in our case, the laboratory that analyzes the saliva sample is required by the state of Illinois to report the data associated with each test to, this, to the Illinois Department of Public Health. So, um, so that information, that gets to Illinois Department of Public Health before right. it engages with us. So right. while they're sending- If there sending was never an app, the, if there was no app, the state of Illinois gets it regardless because yeah, you took a that's test. Right. right. That's right, that's right. And then uh, the, the, uh, the laboratory then sends the, the test results to the Campus Health Center, McKinley mm -hmm. Health Center, Mm -hmm. And it gets recorded in their EMR. Uh, that's called Medicat, mm -hmm. and um, and Medicat then disperses the test results for anybody who's opted in mm -hmm. to have their test results pushed to their app. And um, that happens in a matter of uh, seconds after it gets received at the at Medicat. Mm -hmm. So people are getting, and that is um, it's encrypted in transit. Mm -hmm. And it's decrypted by a private key on your phone, right. so it's right. very it's a very secure uh, it's a very it's a very secure way of sharing that information. Right. Excellent. So so I I do want to talk a little bit about how you know how the university is actually kind of affecting contact tracing for all intents and purposes. But let me ask you another question. What if I'm not comfortable with this? What if I in my freshman year look at say, you know what, this is not for me. I don't, I don't want to do this. I, you've done a great job, but I'm not comfortable. What, what are my options? So you're, it's, it's an excellent question, but your scenario is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Freshmen are just like totally using it. And it's actually, it's, it's people my age, they're like, oh, yeah, I don't trust this. I don't, I don't know how this is. You know, I've, I've read enough about Google and Facebook. I don't, I don't want to do this. So, um, so, um, so there's a class of individuals, and there's another class of individuals, uh, people who work hard every day, who have um, who come to camp uh, campus and are essential workers, who uh, get paid so little that they can't afford the latest Android or, or uh, iPhone. And um, so there's another group of people. So we've done two things on campus to try and address these, these concerns. The first thing that we did was we bought, um, we bought 1,500 uh, Android, uh, new Android phones. Um, and we've created a, a we've always had a loaner program on campus to loan technology, but we dramatically expanded that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I checked as of last week, uh, uh, 600 of those have been loaned out to people that want to use them. So um, if anybody's got a phone that's not, um, that doesn't work with the app, you can loan a phone, you can borrow a phone from campus for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you can renew it again at the at the end of that year if you'd like as well. Hopefully, no one okay, needs then, to renew it. <laughs> I'm hoping no one needs to renew. <laughs> that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then for um, people concerned um, about the use of an app and privacy and the chancellor's uh, or president uh, correcting them, um, we've developed an alternative system. It still requires a, a, a the testing schedule, and um, uh, the building entry people, um, instead of showing them your app, um, we've got a boarding pass system mm -hmm. that's set up where they can print out a boarding pass. It's a little bit slower, um, but it works. It works well, well enough. And um, it looks like about 10% of, of people on campus are using that process. So about 90% are using the app, about 10% are using the alternative. Uh, app. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it, do you have any students who are, who are opting for online learning? Like, is, is that an option and can they do that as well? Yes, it's a very important component of what we've done. So we worked really hard to model the ways in which we could keep the spread of the virus as low as possible. And um, the first thing that we did was we moved about two thirds of our classes and almost all of the very large classes online. Hmm. Uh, we limited the size of any class to 50 people based on the governor's recommendation. Um, so the largest classrooms on campus can hold 50 people. 
the biggest class sizes are now 50 people. Um, so only about a third of the courses are being taught in person. All, all those are relatively small classes and we maintain strict social distancing guidelines and mask wearing um, for, the, for, uh, for those classes. Um, so we did take those steps, yeah. Right. So uh, how, how's it going so far? Right, so we hear, we hear different reports, some are great, some are less than great, but tell, tell us how it's going so far. So, um, started off well. Uh, we, had some, we had so many tests uh, a few days that we got behind in the uh, reporting because the, the laboratory was overwhelmed. So we had, uh, one day we had 18,000 tests, another day we had 17,500 tests. And so we adjusted that by going to three shifts a day at the laboratory to do the testing. So now it's a, it's 24 hours a day, uh, and most people are getting their results back. I think the average result gets back in about eight hours, uh, shorter if you're uh, if you have a negative test. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happened and was, that is because uh, why is it why is it shorter oh, if you have a negative test as opposed to a positive? It, if you if you test if a sample is tested positive, we put it back in line and we test it a second mm -hmm. time to make sure that uh, in fact it is positive. We don't want to give people um, a false positive. Because right. that, I mean, it has really important implications for their lives and the for lives sure. of the people around them. So we double, we double check all the positive uh, test results. Um, so things were going uh, pretty well. We had some adjustments that we had to make in terms of the throughput in the, um, in the lab. Uh, in addition to the three shifts a day, we also ordered uh, a number of robotic tools and we changed some of the procedures to reduce the handling and human touch on the, on the samples. And that's also increased the uh, speed with which we can do things. And then um, right around September 1st or so, or the first week in September, we noticed uh, a fairly steep increase in um, the percent positivity hmm. of the cases. And um, they, they rose from, you know, around, I think the low before classes started was around one tenth of 1% or two tenths of 1%. And um, at the peak after this, a couple of weeks after the start of classes, we got to about 2.8% positivity. So. Uh, a very steep increase, um, many cases per day. And um, then we, as, as soon as we saw that happening, we met uh, with campus leadership and we created a fairly aggressive set of plans. So the first thing that we did was um, we moved everybody on campus to testing twice a week. Uh, we, um, we moved uh, to encourage all students to uh, do a kind of a partial lockdown where they could go to class, they could go to get groceries and um, do the essentials of life, but we asked them not to socialize. Uh, we worked with the city of Champaign and, and Urbana to uh, close down any indoor bars and move uh, the bar activity outdoors. We encouraged students not to participate at all. Uh, the the uh, local governments uh, raised the entry of bars age, the age of entry to 21. Um, uh, so those are those are some of the things that we did. And then we also talked with our colleagues at the public health district, and they were overwhelmed with the number of cases they were getting, and they couldn't con they couldn't deal with moving people into isolation as quickly as their protocol suggest. Mm -hmm. And they were having trouble making sure people were in quarantine and supporting them in quarantine because of so many cases. So we moved, we created an, uh, a new team on campus. We call it Shield T30. Uh, and the goal there is the T stands for time. And the goal is to when um, when you get a, a result that gets pushed to you um, that's positive, our goal is that within 30 minutes, uh, someone from campus is in touch with you and is working with you to move you to isolation, to protect you and make sure you're supported, but also to protect the people that live near you, live with you and live near you. Um, so with that comprehensive set of things, 
moved things uh, in the right direction, moved things down very rapidly uh, until the, we were at about the positivity rate about two weeks after that kind of partial shutdown and the imposition of all these other strategies. The testing rate, uh, the positivity rate was uh, two tenths or 2.5, percent so a quarter of a percent or three tenths of a percent. Um, and then in the last probably five days or so, uh, as we've gotten further away from that set of isolation practices, we've noticed that the positivity rate is going up. So today, the seven-day positivity rate is at 0.4, which mm -hmm. has really got our attention. And we're looking very carefully at a number of strategies uh, for identifying hotspots, removing some, removing individuals who live in a geographic region around a hotspot to testing three times a week. Uh, and we've moved to take anybody who's 22 years old or older, or anybody who's a, a graduate student or a campus employee, now we're testing them once a week. Mm -hmm. Because um, the reason that we're doing that is we want to, we want to make sure the laboratory has a fast enough throughput that we identify positive results as quickly as possible after people uh, deposit their saliva sample uh, in an effort to uh, get them into isolation and, and uh, get the support that they need as quickly as possible. So, so just amazing, amazing, amazing logistics. I just want to say that, and I think uh, some of the comments that we're getting in through the chat uh, echo that sentiment. There's a lot of curiosity about how good the test is, how accurate the test is, and, and maybe you could just comment a little bit on you know, how did you guys think about that? How do you think about the utility of the test in terms of turnaround as well as precision? So the, the, the gold standard is the nasal pharyngeal swab. And um, the, uh, we, did the, we did the very standard protocols that the CDC and FDA uh, required in terms of um, assessing the, um, the, the new test against the standard. And as you know, the standard has some trouble with it. And um, so we, we, uh, we did, a, the test did an excellent job of um, uh, matching um, uh, positivity for positivity over the, over the many samples that were explored. The good news about our test is that, um, I guess that one of the first saliva tests that got uh, published was the Rutgers, Rutgers. and then Yale. Yep. Yale published its, uh, and then we did a compare. Uh, Yale's wor Yale worked with us, and then they published right. theirs. They got theirs out faster. Uh, right. Our test is eight times more sensitive than the Yale test that's been that's been FDA approved. So mm -hmm. our our test is very sensitive, um, and we can we can test very low levels of viral load. In, uh, in a millimeter of saliva sample. And mm -hmm. um, that's opening up some really exciting opportunities for us because now we're, we're talking about starting a study in which we look at people who are in quarantine. Mm -hmm. You know that all the students that we get in quarantine, only nine to 10% of those students actually develop the disease. So right Do, now- When you say develop the disease, this is if they've been exposed or if they're positive, they have symptoms. What, what do you- oh. This is in quarantine. So uh, if you've got a positive test, you're in isolation. Right. And, if, and uh, let's say you've been exposed to a person. Let's say you live with someone who recently tested positive. That person will be placed in isolation and you'll be placed in quarantine. And in quarantine, um, in our county, you have, to be, uh, you have to stay in quarantine for 14 days and you get a, you get a, a, a PCR test on the fourth day after uh, the person the first left exposure. your house. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the last exposure, yeah. Right. right. And, and you count uh, days as day zero, the day that that person left. That's day zero. Mm -hmm. So four days after that, you can get a, you get a, you get a test. And that test is only designed to say whether you can get to stay in quarantine or if you're, if you're positive yourself, you get moved into isolation at that mm. point. Got it. Um, so right now, uh, gosh, Michelle, think about isolation and quarantine. Think about how many centuries we've been using isolation and quarantine 
or visitors or people that we think are diseased. It's, it's, it's four or five centuries old practice and it has enormous public health benefits, mm -hmm. but it also has enormous social and economic consequences, especially when 90 or 91 percent of the people don't need to be in quarantine because they're never going to develop the infection. Right. So the question that we've got right now, because we have this highly sensitive test that will tell you you have very low levels of virus in your saliva, we're, we're uh, engaging in a study that will help us chart the viral load of a person from the onset uh, mm. over time. Mm -hmm. And so we've got ideas about the viral load that, that would be infectious, that would mm -hmm. kind of be minimum level that would be infectious. And um, so we're, we're beginning to be able to ask really interesting questions that we think could have societal wide implications in terms of how we might have a 21st century understanding about isolation and quarantine. Right, right. So, so one of the other things that I think um, people want to understand is uh, how do you make sure, especially if a student's been exposed or what have you, that they are getting their tests regularly? Can you talk a little bit about what are the rules and how you use technology for that? Um, so are you, are you asking about uh, people who have been already diagnosed or people who no. are... Uh, people. People who've been exposed, so if they get an exposure alert, um, or just the, how do you make sure your students are getting tested once a week or twice a week? Okay, so the way we make sure that students get tested uh, uh, on the schedule is to, is to require that they show their entry status upon entering a building. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's been very effective. And that's one of the reasons why we're given about 10,000 tests a day. Um, and then for students in, um, for people who have been in isolation, um, you, you don't need to get tested when you're in isolation. And in quarantine, you should get tested um, on, the, on the fourth day after exposure. Mm -hmm. now, now, here's the thing. Because, we, because when we developed the app, we really listened to our colleagues in Europe about privacy and we listen to the advocates and passionate people who study this every day here on campus. And we made, we made a very strong statement about our approach to privacy. We're gonna be a privacy first platform or privacy by design. What that means is if you self-report symptoms that you've got symptoms that are consistent with the virus, you're the only person that knows. Hmm. Campus doesn't know. Your department head doesn't know. Your, your colleagues do not know. The public health department does not know. And the same thing with exposure notification. If you get an exposure notification, you're the only person that knows. And um, the implications in both cases are that you'll get uh, your building entry access will be denied. If mm -hmm. you've reported symptoms, your access to buildings will be denied until you get a negative test. And as soon as you get a negative test, then boom, you're fine. Um, for exposure notification, if you've gotten an exposure notification, your building access will be denied. Um, and you can get a test on the fourth day after you've been exposed with the day of exposure as day mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. On that fourth day, if you get a negative test, you're fine, you're good to go. Um, okay. So there's a, there's a little bit of uh, the use of the building entry um, status card that either grants or denies it is a is a pretty significant tool in order to help people um, encourage people to maintain their testing protocol. Right. And just one last more, one last question about the test, and then we can we can talk about some other things. But why 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 not use the fifteen minute test? Why not use the new rapid test? Why did you guys why, why go develop your own test? So the, the, like the Abbott test that's 15 minutes, yes, the Abbott yes. test. The, the Abbott, ID now, out. and now there's the antigen test. Yeah, and, right. yeah, right. So those tests really emerged in August. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were, you know, <laughs> in August, we had um, 17 testing sites built mm -hmm. on campus. Right. And we had hired hundreds of people mm -hmm. to uh, maintain those sites. We'd purchased the equipment, so we'd remodeled the laboratories. We yeah. were... I mean, by, by mid-August, we were ready to do 10,000 tests a day. Um, right, right. 
the, another answer to that question is that um, the Abbott test is um, it's not nearly as accurate. It's good for surveillance, but it's not really that good in terms of it. it if you get a positive test there, you need to go and get another follow up test. Yeah. And so it, and it doesn't allow for the kind of rapid, broad based surveillance when you've got a community of 50,000 people that you want to test every sure. week or multiple times a week. Right. And just and just for the audience, I just want to clarify. So the ID now test, I think that's a PCR test. And that came out in, I don't know, May, something like that. But that's exp it's expensive, right? You need the reader. It's like you said, you have to get double tested. Um, and it's quite expensive. The, the newer Abbott test, the five minute test, which is the antigen test, I think, like you said, that didn't come out until um, August. And so by that time, right, you guys were, were already set up. And I presume, again, that one of the big reasons was both the supply chain, because getting those nasal pharyngeal swabs is, was very difficult all through the spring, as well as the, the cost. Um, if, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, yeah, that's very true. Okay. And, and you know what? Um, as we've uh, been doing all this, mm -hmm. uh, other colleagues on our campus and elsewhere are making new innovations. And there's these lamp uh, tests mm -hmm. that, are, that are emerging that are very fast. And um, that there's hints that they may be uh, relatively inexpensive, $20, $15 per test. Mm -hmm. um, and they're 15 minutes as well. Um, and there's discussions about how, wow, you know, you could, um, we have a really wonderful center for performing arts on campus and mm -hmm. that's closed down. So there's no in-person concerts or plays or um, performances of any kind, dance performances of any kind uh, at this world-class center. And that's a, that's a, that's a loss. Um, and so the idea is, gosh, you know, you could, um, you could decide to go to a performance and show up within some window prior to the performance, get your lamp test, and um, you could build that, the cost of that test into the price of the ticket. And um, you know, you get the lamp test and then you're free to get, you're free to get in. And that might be a way to help people um, engage a little bit uh, more rapidly, there's been talk at, um, in the community of um, if this technology that's being developed here uh, can do that. Uh, I've heard restaurants saying, oh gosh, you know, I would love to be able to do that. You have to show up a little early and we'll build the cost of the test into the bill at the end. Right. You, know, you right. could have dinner with your friends. I would pay a lot. I would pay a lot for that. <laughs> so, yeah. so Tell us, I mean, I think there's two big questions. The first is, well, let me start with the sort of smaller question. H how are you monitoring how people are feeling about this, how people are acting on this, right? Like if we go back to the whole idea of a, of a more healthy community, right? Th this is a learning opportunity for you all. Can you talk a little bit about how you're learning from it, what and what you're learning from it? Yeah, that's, th those are really important questions. Um, and they're important in the media for members of our community. And they're important from a scholarly standpoint in terms of using this um, really negative situation as a way to learn and, and shed new knowledge on these really important questions. So um, the campus is engaged with the, the, we have a Center for Social and Behavioral Sciences on campus. The Center for Social and Behavioral uh, Sciences is, um, is conducting a series of um, uh, surveys. They've sampled um, people across the state of Illinois. They've done a, um, a probability-based sample that um, gets a higher participation rate from African-American and Latinx individuals. Uh, and they're also uh, serving um, members of campus, uh, talking about a whole range of issues with respect to anxiety and loneliness and stress, and also their reaction to using technology in, in, a, in a fashion that has real clear implications for health and well-being. Um, so we're using the expertise and depth of knowledge that we've got on campus to try and uh, keep tabs on, this in, on, on these questions uh, because we want to make a comprehensive set of uh, advances in our understanding and knowledge from the testing side to viruses to epidemiology to modeling to the, right. the social and behavioral sciences. University of Illinois has it all. So, so that also begs the question, 
right? How, how are we disseminating this? How, how, you know, obviously it looks like, you know, you're still making a go of it in your little corner of the world, but what can you bring to other parts of the state as well as other parts of the country? And how are you doing that if so? Well, so there's a significant, two significant efforts. Uh, one is called SHIELD Illinois. A SHIELD is the name that we give to the comprehensive effort that we've been engaged in here. It includes the, the, the modelers who assess, who, you know, how often we test and who needs to be tested in hotspots, the testing folks who develop this, the test and deliver on the analysis every day, and the, um, and the app, the Safer Illinois app folks who, who develop the app. So together we call ourselves the SHIELD team. And um, uh, the university has uh, spun up an entity uh, called SHIELD Illinois that is exploring with the Illinois Department of Public Health and the governor the capacity of, uh, of the state to support the dissemination of the entire protocol uh, to, to schools, to high schools, to K-12 When you schools, say the protocol, colleges. Do, do you mean the test, the test and the technology, the test and the rules? What, what do you mean by the protocol? We mean the whole, we mean mm -hmm. the whole shebang, the whole shield effort, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the smart analytics, the, 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 uh, the saliva based PCR test and the laboratory equipment and analysis capability go along with it. And, uh, and an app that could be um, geographically modified to fit your county, the county that you're in right now. Yeah. So we're we're in conversations. So we've spun up this entity, and it has a it has leadership and it has staff, and we're in conversations with the, the governor and the governor's office and the Illinois Department of Public Health to um, to talk about how we might um, um, use what we've learned and the capacities uh, across the state. Right. And the second thing that we've done is um, we've started a, the the board of trustees of the University of Illinois has started another entity called SHIELD T3, and it has identical responsibilities except outside the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. So one entity is for within the state of Illinois and another entity is to, uh, to the world. And we've had, we've had conversations with people from probably every state in, in the country and the territories, um, uh, from India, from, uh, from London, from Ireland, um, uh, Guam, so uh, you know a whole bunch of places have been Wisconsin have been in touch with us. <laughs> Wisconsin, yes, we're we're, uh, we're engaged with a really interesting dialogue with Wisconsin right now, and it looks like Wisconsin and Madison will be the first uh, university to adopt the entire program up there. And you know, we feel for our our uh, Big Ten brethren in in Wisconsin. They're the state positivity rate today is 19%. So they did a, almost 40,000 tests yesterday. 19% of them came back positive. It's, it's a really, it's a scary situation in Wisconsin and um, we're, we're wishing our colleagues up there the very best and we're hoping that we can play some role in um, bringing that down. Do, do you think that we can do you think that we can use something like this to reopen our lives until the vaccine is available, right? Like I'm asking you to kind of look into the future, but just what does your gut tell you about that? Um, I think to some extent we can. I don't know how this would work in daycare or primary schools. Uh, I think in high schools, uh, it, it's possible it could work, although there are plenty of kids in high school who don't have smartphones or whose parents would be freaked out about their children carrying a smartphone. So there's, there's a whole bunch of social considerations right. that, that we're not aware of or that we, we haven't solved. We have, we have problems to solve. Um, it's very possible. I can tell you, Michelle, that in, in Champaign and Urbana, um, bar owners and restaurant owners are now asking people to show their building entry status that they've had a recent negative test before they're in, before they can get in there's been mm -hmm. uh television and newspaper stories about that and um, people are now identifying those places as safe places to go because of the because they they've done that so you could imagine large-scale businesses you could imagine any place where you need access to it uh, could, could employ something like this right. 
a physical space anywhere we need access to a physical space, right? Right. Yeah, people have even suggested um, transit as a as a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, once, as soon as you mention transit, then you think, oh gosh, you know, how do you deal with the equity access uh, issues? Of, a lot of questions uh, of, of testing and the and the and the technology. So mm -hmm. um, you can imagine how it could be used, but there are real significant. Um, Right. The social and financial hurdles that need to be addressed as well. Right. I, I mean, I know we have a ton more questions, um, but I think we are out of time. Um, so just first and foremost, I would like to thank you, Bill. Uh, I would like to thank the entire team at the University of Illinois. Uh, I know you guys have been working at breakneck speed since probably March. And, uh, you know, we, we check the numbers all the time and are rooting for you because when you guys can open up, that means that there's hope for the rest of us. Um, and I also want to thank the audience uh, for coming and participating and try to get to as many as your questions um, as possible. I think we are all inspired. And uh, again, just thank you to the audience. Thank you to you. And that's it.